it's, it's my job this morning to talk to you about digital advantage. And we certainly have all lived through unprecedented times, let's be honest, both business and personal. But, and it is a genuine but, um, digital transformation is not new. You know, we were seeing IT change being necessitated by a whole host of macro trends that were happening pre-pandemic. You know, as we move towards a sort of a digital world, um, I think by 2030, you know, it was forecast that 70% of new value would be created by digitally enabled business models. Um, we were in the middle of a, a data explosion, you know, creating a lot more data than we could probably manage or monetize. And more and more than that needed to be processed at real time. Um, there was increasing importance on cybersecurity. Um, year on year increase in DDoS attacks was at an all times high. Um, and that is something that, you know, CIOs, CTOs are constantly looking at. And underpinning all of this was this, this change in sort of consumer behavior, um, you know, def demographic shifts that were led by, you know, an increasing group of digital natives, as we like to call them. I have two of them myself that, um, you know, have been streaming, gaming, really sort of, you know, increasing interconnection bandwidth, left, right and center. But, you know, at Equinix, we have a, a very interesting uh, vantage point you know we have 227 plus data centers located worldwide and within those data centers you know around 10,000 companies are really running their digital businesses but i don't want to talk too much about equinix i really want to talk about the landscape because that's what we're we're going to uh, discuss and that's what our next speaker is also going to talk about as well so really you know it's common sense it's, if if the world is moving towards digital business, it needs a digital infrastructure. And what we mean by that really is underpinned by these four statements. You know, the future of IT now is everywhere. Uh, the role of a centralized corporate data center is shrinking. It's not necessarily fit for purpose in terms of how we need to scale. The future infrastructure that all of our businesses work within is an infrastructure of partners, whether that's networks, cloud it's not just one it's enterprise to enterprise we need we need to interconnect we need to collaborate um, from an it perspective it's certainly a hybrid world core workloads are shifting to the edge blended infrastructure consumption on demand you know the ability to consume things as a service incredibly important and at these what we call exchange points these ecosystems are interconnecting with each other um, and you, we, we're starting to see that, especially in uh, businesses that have been of true digital origin, but also businesses that are having to make that shift from what I would call physical presence to, uh, to a greater online presence. So that was happening. And with all of that, we then had COVID. And it is undoubtedly, you know, COVID has accelerated transformation. It has accelerated uh, IT thought processes. It has accelerated the way the way that we work. Um, so really what we mean by digital advantage is that we view this in the way that companies set, set themselves up. And if you look at that IT structure, um, network optimization is really a critical first step. But companies that we see within our platform tend to follow this core edge exchange structure. You know, IT is delivery is distributed a mix of regional core and edge location, which better meets the demands of digital. It supports low latency requirements that are needed at the edge and are much nearer the end users. Now these end users used to be customers. Actually, we're all end users now. We're all at an edge. Um, a lot of companies have adopted remote working and we know, and I think it's fair to say, and this will be interesting to discuss in the groups, is you know how much of that will go back it's certainly not going to all go back there are a lot of companies across multiple sectors are looking at hybrid working models but when you serve the edge user experience is consistent and when critical demands are placed on the infrastructure businesses that have you know peaks and troughs it can be dynamically managed much more easier than if it was in a central location so the core is where businesses tend to choose a network dense location with the greatest on-ramp for clouds and private connectivity to key partners 
and the edge is when they need to build more infrastructure that's closer to the users, to the eyeballs, to their displaced workforce. And at the edge, this is where you're going to be able to support those really latency critical applications. So streaming, gaming, centers for IoT devices, um, you know, and that increased pressure from um, remote from remote workers. So all industries we see are typically doing this based on five transformational steps. These you sort of see bottom right of the slide, starting with network optimization, moving through a cloud enablement journey, and then looking at those edge points. If the first two stages are delivered correctly, then it tends to fund others in terms of both cost and better performance. And what we're seeing now is a blend of both physical and virtual infrastructure. So in our data centers where people just used to put physical kit, they now don't even need to put physical kit. They can spin up a point of presence in actually a matter of hours where provis provisioning would previously have taken weeks or even months. So our business is transformed because it has to help other businesses transform. So when people talk to us about what we do, yes, we have a data center platform, a huge global data center platform, but it is the interconnection services and the edge services that work together that are now supporting uh, businesses and are now creating, in our view, this digital advantage. So by locating within one of these uh, facilities, either physically or virtually, that now enables you to reach anywhere in the world in our location footprint in a matter of seconds. By actually deploying services that are now more virtually orientated than physically orientated, you can serve customers much more effectively and actually shift from a sort of um, a, a more capex model to a much more opex model. And again, coming out of COVID, uh, IT budgets may be under pressure, but what we're seeing is about optimizing that cost and not cutting that cost. So we see this not just in the UK, we see this globally. We see it across all businesses um, and we see businesses adapt in different ways. One of the things I'd like to leave you with, because I want to keep this quite brief, is that we produce an index. It's four years uh, in the making. It's called the Global Interconnection Index. And within this, we track around 400 companies that are going on a digital journey. We have clearly seen in the last 12 months digital leaders and digital followers. The digital leaders are following this core edge exchange method. The followers are having to change and pivot. But the thing that they've learned is that the more dynamic and more agile their infrastructure is, the more chance they have of being competitive and, and uh, surviving in this digital world. So I'm going to leave that there. So good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining and uh, welcome to the session. So here we're going to talk about uh, becoming a digital leader. So my job here for the next 10 minutes is to give you some ideas and inspiration. So hopefully you can take some of these away to your day job, back into your role, into your organization and get some inspiration on how you can apply digital uh, into your roles or your organization. So before we kick off a little bit about Mars. Uh, so I'm the lead enterprise architect at Mars. I'm responsible for Mars Wrigley, uh, global services and corporate functions business segment. But uh, Mars is a large organization. We have more than 125,000 plus associates or employees, uh, more than 80 plus countries and operations, $35 billion plus in revenue, and one of the largest privately owned companies. So this is home to definitely a lot of uh, well-known global brands such as Orbit, uh, Snickers, Galaxy, m and um, Pedigree, Whiskers, Benz Original, and so on. So very complex business uh, to manage across a large global footprint and therefore brings its challenges and opportunities as well. So before we step into our experience into Mars, I just wanted to level set a little bit at an in industry um, level. So what does the industry talk about digital and how should you become digital? Uh, so here the focus is about raising the digital quotient, what McKinsey calls it as digital quotient is basically the maturity or the digital awareness uh, and growth that your organization is achieving. 
there are four key levers um, in raising the digital quotient and all of them are equally important. So we cannot have one or the other, uh, but we should basically drive everything um, at the same speed. So the first one is strategy. Of course, this is where we discover what does digital mean to us. Um, ultimately, the goal of an organization would be either you know, uh, driving revenue, saving costs, or sometimes driving experience and brand awareness with consumers, customers, et cetera. So this brings a, a different definition for digital at a function, at a team, at an organization level, but this is where we kind of discover what does digital mean to the organization? Are we going to be a pure play disruptor like a Spotify or a Netflix, or are we going to innovate on a, on a completely new business model with our existing products and services? So this applies to your team, your organization, but ultimately the goal here is to ensure that the digital strategy has a way into its corporate strategy because this is where it most effectively gets delivered. Uh, the second one is about driving capabilities at scale. Um, so the focus here is uh, obviously looking at data empowered decision making. If we want to prove a, a hypothesis that it's going to be right, then the focus is always going to be that finding the right data points that make us look good or basically uh, re-emphasizes that whatever decisions we're making is going to be right. The other approach what we are advocating here is exploitation, which is basically discovering facts from the data external and internal and making decisions or judgments based on that. So it's very important that we don't walk into this with a cognitive bias, uh, but might as well drive the decisions based on the data. So connectivity is a very important aspect while the expectation from our suppliers, from our customers, from our consumers, from our employers is that we have to be connected, we have to be device agnostic, and we have to have multiple touch points into the organization and the experience need to be seamless. Well, internally it does present us with some of the great you know, areas where we can leverage data based on experience, based on, I would say, market history, track record, industry, et cetera, to drive these decisions. The third key lever is about driving agile culture. So here we focus on progress versus perfection. Um, there's no silver bullet here to land digital strategy and be excellent on day one, but this is an iterative process where the teams, the organizations do discover themselves as they go through the process. So it's fundamental here that there needs to be an appetite for risk, but at the same time, it should also be uh, promoted to have a test and learn and scale culture. So test and learn is very important because sometimes you fail fast. And if you fail fast, it's good to fail in a limited blast radius as they call it. So start with a minimum viable product approach, prove your hypothesis is right, test and learn because the conditions are very, very different. What might work in China might not work in the US or the UK. Uh, in China, for example, you have uh, you know, to work around the ecosystem of Tencent or Alibaba. In UK, you might have more external data set that might not be available in some of the other regions that you go with. So it's important we promote this test and learn culture. And the last one is organization and talent. While uh, we need people to practice some breakthrough thinking, we need a good balance of thinkers and doers. So we can practice techniques here like you know, inspiration, provocation, execution. But uh, the, the fundamental aspect here is non-traditional structures. What this means is, is a team of teams set up wherein we're not siloing teams at your marketing department or your sales department or your finance function or your X, Y, Z. The goal here is to form a cross-functional team, apply the lens of a customer or a consumer and solve problems holistically where we break the boundaries of teams or departments within this particular ecosystem. So digital definitely provides uh, the table rather than having a seat at the table. Digital is the table where we could actually bring different departments, functions together and help solve problems holistically and end-to-end. -end. So now let's talk about how do we apply digital at Mars. So we have practiced uh, using the Mars digital engine. So there are three uh, wheels in this particular engine. The first one is finding the right problem because the risk here is we as technologists might run into a bias wherein, oh, we have solved this problem 15 times, so the 16 times should be the same. Or basically we might also end up saying that, okay, this is what worked at another organization. So therefore it might work here and so on. So the risk here is solving for the wrong problem. And the focus in our digital engine to find the right problem using 
you know, well-known techniques like design thinking is very, very important. So we understand and solve for a problem in a user-centric um, or a customer-centric way. So the second uh, piece here is about how you solve. So once you've identified the right problem, make sure the problem is right. Solving it using latest technologies like the next generation could be AI, machine learning, um, and, and so on and so forth. But the, the focus here is to solve using the next gen technology so that the solution is here to stay as well as it's future proof. The third piece is automation. Why is this important? We want to release ourselves from the mechanical work, automate once you've discovered the solution using techniques like robotics process automation and so on, and move on to find the next problem. Because guess what? The next problem is already ready for us to, to hit on. So this is what we practice at Mars. And this is what we call as digital engine, where we have three key phases, find, solve, and automate. So the next piece is about how I bring this back into my team, right? So I'm part of the Mars enterprise architecture team. And obviously being um, an enterprise architecture team for a $35 billion organization with large global brands and different business models is definitely a challenge in itself. However, we have adopted a very a uh, simplistic approach here to focus on three key things, uh, looking at simplification, transformation, and innovation. So while we are an architecture function, we focus on developing business transformation roadmaps, uh, delivering architecture governance and risk elimination. However, we also keep our eyes and ears open for what's happening in the technology industry, what's happening in the business industry, as well as what opportunities are presented from within Mars. And this helps us walk into the digital ventures ecosystem what we call as agile innovation. So um, things like you know, setting up a virtual Halloween trick or treat experience digitally, or ensuring that our pet parents are connected virtually with our vets uh, during the course of a pandemic, or allowing our retailers to place orders on WhatsApp, where some of the ventures that were born out of this digital ventures, and where we try to be purposeful, with our innovation, uh, the speed is obviously the key here, quick time to market, um, test and learn and fail fast. Those are the things I spoke about earlier. And obviously with architecture involved, we are always looking at if this is successful, this needs to be a scalable solution rather than you know, try to reiterate or reinvent the wheel when we go into scale. So this is how we drive things within enterprise architecture. And, and this is my last slide. So, specifically zooming into what does a digital venture journey map look like, right? So the first phase is about learning, absorbing, and ideating, because the key here is we need to understand what we are solving for and whom we are solving for. So there's always a learning journey uh, because every situation is different. Every organization is different. Uh, it brings its uh, culture, challenges, and other opportunities. So it's important we learn, absorb, and ideate in the first phase of the second phase is where we plan for our digital ventures, looking at how you plan, prioritize, and align with our corporate strategy, our business goals, and those prioritization ventures will then make it into the incubation stage. This is where we test, learn, and iterate. Three to six months is the key here. We are not going to have you know, two-year, three-year long projects before we deliver value. This is all about incremental value delivery for our organization. And Based on the learnings of this particular incubation, we look at, okay, if this is successful, how do you optimize, measure, and scale this? Scale could be go wider in a particular geography, or you go into another geography, or you go global within a segment, or a cross-segment, or a cross-function, and so on. So this is, in a nutshell, what we practice uh, in a digital venture. And yeah, I would like to leave you with a thought that it comes, it's as simple as saying you cannot swim by just learning a book. So digital is all about knowing what to do and doing what you want to do. So with that said, thanks for your time.